Continuing with the oral cavity boundaries, at the inferior boundary, we have the body of the tongue, the anterior mobile portion, and we have the genuohyoid and mylohyoid muscles that provide the extra support for the inferior boundary. As far as oral cavity structures, we have the oral vestibule, which is the space between the cheeks or lips and the teeth, the frenulum of the upper lip, it attaches the gums to the upper lip. A thick mucosa with ridges covering the hard palate. This provides traction for compression of food by the tongue. And then the frenulum of the lower lip that attaches the gums to the lower lip. You've probably heard of someone being tongue-tied before or ankyloglossia. In that condition, it is something that's present at birth. The frenulum of the tongue is too short. So people really do have problems with speaking. I'm um, continuing with oral cavity structure. The gingiva are the gums. These are the ridges of the oral mucosa that surround the base of each tooth. It firmly attaches to the periosteum of the underlying bone. Then you have the palatal arches. This is located on either side of the uvula. Palatoglossal arch that extends between the soft palate and the base of the tongue and the palatopharyngeal arch that extends from the soft palate to the pharyngeal wall. The falces are a space between the oral cavity and the oral pharynx, and the tongue, of course, manipulates materials inside the mouth. The surface is flushed by secretions of small glands. The secretions contain water, mucins, and lingual lipase, an enzyme that starts the digestion of lipids. Attached to the floor of the mouth by the frenulum of the tongue, the lingual frenulum. And this is the one I was referring to uh, just a little while ago, that being tongue-tied. Ankyloglossia is tongue-tied. It's present birth frenulum of the tongue is too short. It interferes with breastfeeding in newborns. It interferes with learning to speak in toddlers. Let's go into more detail with the teeth because they are part of the digestive system. The bulk of each tooth is composed of dentin. It's a mineralized matrix similar to the bone but contains no cells. The pulp cavity is the interior of the chamber of the tooth, which you see here. The occlusal surface is the portion of the crown used for crushing, slicing, or chewing. And the enamel covers the dentin of the crown. It's the hardest biologically manufactured substance. It's composed of calcium phosphate. And that requires calcium phosphate and vitamin D for formation and resistance to decay. The gingival sulcus is a shallow groove that surrounds the base of the neck. The epithelial attachment blocks bacteria from accessing the deeper tissues around the root. That's found here. The cement covers the dentin in the root. It's less resistant to erosion than the dentin. The periodontal ligament creates a gomphosis articulation between the root dentin and the alveolar bone. And the root canal is a narrow tunnel within the root of the tooth. It's a passageway for blood vessels and nerves to the pulp cavity. It opens into the root canal, and this is called the apical foramen. The crown is a portion projecting into the oral cavity from the surface of the gums. The neck is the boundary between the crown and the root. And the root is a portion below the gum line. It sits in a bony tooth socket called an alveolus. Has four types of teeth. Each has a distinctive shape and root pattern. The incisors are blade shaped teeth with a single root. They're located at the front of the mouth and they're most useful for clipping or cutting. The canines or cuspids. They're conical with a sharp ridge line and pointed tip. 
They're used for tearing or slashing, and they have a single root. The premolars are bicuspids. They have flattened crowns with prominent ridges. They're used for crushing, mashing, or grinding, and they have one or two roots. And the molars, the very large flattened crowns, uh, the ones with the large flattened crowns with the prominent ridges. They're adapted for crushing and grinding. They typically have three roots in the upper jaw or two roots in the, upper, the lower jaw. As you very well know, there's two sets of teeth through life. They're formed during embryonic development. The deciduous teeth, also called the primary teeth or milk teeth or baby teeth. At two years of age, you have 20 deciduous teeth, five on each side of the upper and lower jaws, two incisors, one canine, two deciduous molars. And then you get your permanent teeth. They gradually replace the deciduous teeth. The periodontal ligaments and roots of the primary teeth erode. The primary teeth fall out or are pushed aside by the secondary teeth. Then you have three additional molars appear on each side of the upper and lower jaws. And the third molars are called your wisdom teeth. There's 32 total permanent teeth. You've probably heard of teeth becoming impacted. This is when they fail to erupt because of overcrowding from the adjacent teeth or from twisting and tilting in the jawbone. Most commonly happens with your wisdom teeth. And the treatment ranges from nothing to having the tooth extracted. Let's move on back in the mouth. The pharynx or the throat. This is a membrane lined cavity posterior to the nose and mouth. It's continuous with the esophagus and it's a common passageway for solid food and liquids and air. There's three regions the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. The function of the esophagus is to actively move food and liquids to the stomach and its structure. It's hollow, it's a muscular tube about 10 inches long, about 0.8 inches wide. The narrowest point is at the beginning, posterior area to the cricoid cartilage. It descends posterior to the trachea. It enters the abdominopelvic cavity through the esophageal hiatus, which is the opening in the diaphragm. As far as the nerves or innervation, it's by the parasympathetic and sympathetic fibers from the esophageal plexus. It maintains resting muscle tone in the circular muscle layers, keeps the lumen closed except when you swallow. Control of movement includes the upper esophageal sphincter. It's a band of smooth muscle that functions as a sphincter. It prevents air from entering the esophagus. And then you have the lower esophageal sphincter or the cardiac sphincter at the inferior end of the esophagus. It's normally contracted and it prevents backflow of anything in the stomach. The layers of the esophageal wall include the mucosa, which is a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and a submucosa, which form the large folds that extend the length of the esophagus, allows for expansion whenever the bolus passes through. Then you have a muscularis externa, which is a superior third. This is mostly skeletal muscle. The middle third is a mix of skeletal and smooth muscle. And the inferior third is composed of smooth muscle only. There's no serosa. It's adventitia, which is connective tissue that anchors the esophagus to the posterior body wall. And that's shown here in this cross section.
Okay, the act of swallowing, also called deglutition. It's initiated voluntarily, but it proceeds automatically. There's three phases of swallowing. The buccal phase, which is voluntary, begins with the compression of the bolus against the hard palate. The tongue forces the bolus into the oropharynx. It elevates the soft palate that seals off the nasopharynx. And you have the entry into the oropharynx that triggers the reflex response. Then you go into the pharyngeal phase. It begins with the stimulation of the tactile receptors in the uvula and the palatine arches. The motor commands from the swallowing center in the medulla oblongata coordinate the muscle contraction in the pharyngeal muscles. The larynx is elevated. The epiglottis is folded. The uvula and soft palate then are elevated. And then the bolus is moved through the pharynx and to the esophagus. The esophageal phase begins as the bolus is forced through the entrance to the esophagus. Then the bolus is pushed towards the stomach by peristalsis. The approach of the bolus triggers the opening of the lower esophageal sphincter, and then the bolus enters the stomach. And the travel time is usually around nine seconds. Liquids can travel faster. A dry or poorly lubricated bolus can require secondary peristaltic waves. Twenty two point nine. The stomach and most of the intestinal tract are suspended by mesenteries and covered by peritoneum. So the peritoneal cavity encloses the stomach and most of the intestine. It's lined by a serous membrane we call the peritoneum. The serous membrane then is divided into the serosa or visceral peritoneum that covers the organs enclosed by the peritoneal cavity. Then you have the parietal peritoneum that lines the inner surface of the peritoneal cavity or uh, the cavity itself. So you remember from 168, visceral means on the organ, parietal means on the cavity. And peritoneum refers to the peritoneal cavity down in the abdomen. Okay, the serous membrane continuously secretes peritoneal fluid into the peritoneal cavity as much as 7 liters per day, but it's reabsorbed. Volume at any one time is about 50 milliliters. A thin layer separates the parietal and visceral surfaces. And this allows sliding movement, so this cuts down on friction or any irritation. The rate of fluid moving into the cavity can be accelerated by the liver disease, kidney disease, heart failure. And accumulation of peritoneal fluid does happen and creates abdominal swelling or ascites. Your dorsal and ventral mesenteries are formed during embryonic development. They suspend the digestive tract and the accessory organs. They develop into other adult connections. The dorsal mesentery becomes the greater omentum, attached to the stomach and transverse colon. It forms a large pouch that extends inferiorly between the anterior body wall and the anterior surface of the small intestine. It contains adipose tissue that provides padding and protection. So that's seen here, the greater omentum. The mesentery proper connects small intestine to the posterior body wall. And then the mesocolon connects large intestine to the posterior body wall. The ventral mesentery then becomes the lesser omentum that connects the stomach to the liver. It provides access route for blood vessels and other structures that enter and leave the liver. And the falciform ligament connects the liver to the anterior body wall. Changing position of the mesenteries. With the elongation of the digestive tract, the position of the mesenteries do change. Some segments of the tract do become fixed in position, but segments of the mesentery proper come into contact.